discussion. Uh, we clearly see in this quotation how such a view differs from mainstream liberal view of freedom as self-determination. According to Bakunin, for instance, social contract theories are wrong not just because they assume that society is not coeval with human beings, but because they take this single individual separated from all others as their starting point of inquiry. As we've already pointed out, Marx too observes that this image of the individual as a discrete being is an ideological construction. The isolated individual does not appear at the beginning of history before the social contract because the more deeply we go back into history, the more the individual appears as dependent, as belonging to a greater whole and enchained by the innumerable ties of tradition. Primitive human beings are far from being the free independent being depicted by certain social contract theories. The freedom they attribute to the individual is a supposed state of nature as a supposed state of nature is in fact that very freedom constructed by the member of the modern civil society. Thus not freedom of the beginning of history but rather freedom in its bourgeois phase. In response to social contract theories, today again in fashion, both Marx and Bakunin oppose the idea that human beings are determined by their position in society. In a passage that echoes contemporary theories of the knowledge of the self, such as Foucault, Bakunin observed that it is not individual who creates society, but it is the society that, so to speak, individualizes itself in the individuals. Bakunin is very well aware that freedom as self-determination is an empty word if there is not such a thing as a self that can autonomously choose. The crucial point, therefore, is not simply doing what I want, but to be sure that what I believe to be the fruit of my choice actually is. If I'm led by the circumstances of my life to believe that my own servitude is either immutable or, or simply desirable, there is no way I can be free. Uh, it's the dilemma of voluntary servitude that has been at the center of anarchism thinking for a long time. Now, in Bakunin view, human beings are determined by both material and representational factors. When still in the womb of their mother, he says, every human being is already determined by a high number of geographical, climatic, economic, and imaginary factors that constitute the nature of their social condition. Again, in an extremely timely passage, Bakuni observes that every generation finds as a ready-made a whole world of ideas, images, and sentiments that it inherits from previous epochs. They do not present themselves to the new board as a system of ideas, since children would not be able to apprehend them in this form. Rather, such a world of ideas imposes itself as a world of personified facts, uh, something that in my own work I've tried to convey with the idea of political myth. Put in more contemporary words, the individual becomes such only through a process of socialization that begins immediately, at least with the very first encounter with language, and in particular, the language of the mother. As psychoanalysis has shown, it's through <laughs> such a process that the individual is led to internalize and assimilate the imaginary signification of the particular society she lives in. To put in Cornelius Castoriadis' words, individuals are at the same time instituting and instituted by society. Society does not exist without the individual that constantly create and recreate society, but at the same time, individual exists only as an institution of the society itself. But if individuals are at the same time instituted and instituted, if, to use Bakunin phrase, individuals are nothing but the society that individualizes itself in them, then you cannot be free unless everybody else is free. A master who doesn't recognize the freedom of his slaves is for this very reason not free himself. In this way, he contributes to perpetrate the image of slavery within the society of which is part, and this very slavery will come back to him in a form or another. As Malatesta, by commenting on Bakunin, says, quote, 
I strongly care about what all other human beings are because however independent I may appear or believe to be from my social position, be it a pope, czar or even emperor, I am the perpetual product of what human beings are in their reciprocal relationships. If they are ignorant, miserable, slaves, my existence is determined by their slavery. I, enlightened and clever, will be stupid for their stupidity. I, brave and courageous, will be slave for their enslavement. I reach shiver inside for their misery. I, privilege, turn pain in front of their just injustice. I, who want to be free, cannot be so because all other human beings around me do not yet want to be free and therefore they become against me an instrument of oppression." End quote. It's a very radical idea of freedom that you've probably understood. But it's one that, if read in light of more recent development, is today more timely than ever. Second step, called back to, back to freedom beyond autonomy. Let me now speak about two main consequences that I think follow from an emphasis on uh, the notion of freedom and the freedom of equals. The first is that, however abstract this, mu this view may appear, it can only be realized in a very concrete way. Not by chance, Bakunin defines it a materialistic understanding of freedom. If freedom is to be realized not just by a separate self, which doesn't exist, but through society, it follows that an entire reorganization of society is necessary. For Bakunin, this implies a restructuring of society from below, according to the principle of free association and federation. But why is it so? Free, what lies at the basis of the notion of free federalism? Free federalism follows from a view of freedom articulated in three moments. The first, Bakunin says, is the positive and social moment and consists in the development of all human faculties and potentialities through education and material well-being. <coughs> all things that can only be acquired through the physical intellectual war of the whole society. It's a view very close to Marx's positive conception of freedom according to which freedom does not consist in the negative capacity to avoid this and that, but rather in the positive power to develop our potentialities. The second moment is the realization of, of, of the, for the realization of free federalism is the negative one. Bakunin calls it the moment of the revolt. It is the revolt against every authority, human or divine. First and foremost, it's a revolt against God or any other form of transcendent authority because, to quote Bakunin, as long as we have a master in the sky, we will not be free on earth. But this revolt must be combined with the revolt against specifically human form of authority. Here Bakunin introduces a fine distinction between the legal and formal authority of the state and what he calls the tyranny of society. To revolt against the first, against the state, it's easier because the enemy can easily be identified. But the revolt against the tyranny of society is much more complicated because, as we have seen, to a large extent, we are a product of society. Society, as we have already suggested, exercises its tyranny through customs, traditions, sentiments, prejudices and habits on both our material and intellectual life. Part of this influence is inevitable, but part of it is not. But Kuni seems to believe at times that education and scientific knowledge is sufficient to this liberation. But I believe that we have more grounds today to be skeptical about knowledge. Knowledge is not enough. Knowledge does not liberate from power simply because it's a form of power in itself. The production of scientific knowledge is no exception to the tyranny of society because as Michel Foucault has shown us, it may even be the chief means for the domestication of revolt and the creation of compliant subjects. Natural and social sciences, from chemistry, demography, sociology, have all proved to be potential means to domesticate human beings rather than to liberate them. 
Where to stop from then? Where to get the liberation from the subtle tyranny that society exercises through its customs, traditions and sentiments? Here I believe the more radical interpretation of federalism is of great help. The old anarchist motto, multiply your association and be free, can indeed be seen as a multiplication of both the political but also the social and imaginary ties one is subjected to by entering into contact with different social imaginaries and expanding one's, one's own knowledge to different regimes of truth, it's possible to find a moment of friction where the tyranny of society breaks down. As I will try to show in a moment, it is here, at the particular today, the possibility of freedom lies. But before I do so, let me briefly mention another consequence of this conception of freedom understood as freedom of equals. Huh? So the first is that we move from freedom, uh, uh, freedom is a, it's something that must be obtained uh, socially uh, through a material change in the nature of society. And the second is that by focusing on this notion of freedom, we implicitly take a distance from the reduction of freedom to simple autonomy. Now, there are many possible definitions of autonomy but the most important, uh, at least because the most influential, is that which goes back to its etymology. Autonomy literally means autos, nomos, to give you the law to yourself. From this original meaning and through the influence of philosophers like Rousseau and Kant, the term came to mean self-determination more in general, as if every determination would be happen or happen in the form of subjection to the law which I believe is far from being the case, but I'll come back to this in a moment. Now, the concept of autonomy is not immune to criticism. The most obvious one is that it presupposes a self that can actually give the law to itself. As we have already suggested, this is far from being unquestioned. Furthermore, the idea that of a separate self uh, immediately leads to what I would like to call a limitative view of freedom. If we believe that human beings are self-enclosed selves, endowed with autonomy, the problem necessarily becomes that of disciplining such autonomy in order to make space for the autonomy of others. Like billiard balls colliding on a green table, the freedom of individuals are deemed to conflict with one another, and the problem becomes that of putting limit to them. On the contrary, if we assume that we are the product of society, a completely different perspective emerges. The problem is no longer how to limit freedom, but rather how to enhance it. In other words, the imperative becomes no longer limit freedom so that everybody can enjoy it, but create it, because it may even be the case that it's not yet there. Different authors have tried to address this problem uh, by arguing that autonomy is also a social enterprise. Radical thinkers such as Cornelius Castoriadis uh, or workerist thinkers in Italy have, for instance, tried to solve the dilemma by arguing that autonomy is possible only in society. Workerists in Italy argued, for instance, for the autonomy of the proletariat, showing that agency is immanent to its spontaneous action and does not need the guiding role of the party. On the other side, French Marxists um, like Castoriadis articulated the project of autonomy in relation to the problem of the imaginary signification within which we are all socialized, something very close, in my view, to Bakunin's idea of the tyranny of society. According to Castoriadis, we are autonomous if we are the origins of what will be, and we know ourselves to be such. Autonomy means that your discourse has to take the place of what is given as the discourse of the other, a view that, like Bakunin one, stresses the importance of the cognitive means for the realization of